Hey, what's up, everyone? It is time for another edition of Ask Mike. I know we had a couple of weeks off, but we're right back at it, and we're going to... No COVID updates. No COVID updates. I'm just we're blowing switching. it off. <laughs> forget about it. So we're going to get right to it. We're going to get to the good stuff. Uh, our first question is about looking ahead for this Arkansas football team. It comes from Pork Link on Hogville, who says... Never hear anything about Dominique Johnson. Noticed him a couple of times on special teams. How is he progressing, and does he fit in with the team's plans going forward? You know, like a lot of freshmen, he didn't play a lot this year. He did play on special teams. He was, uh, I think, a number two at his position on mm -hmm. special teams. Did a good job. He's a big physical running back. I think they like him for his ability to block in the backfield. Yeah. Um, once... Uh, once the situation at running back changed late in the season with Rakeem Boyd opting out, then he moved up to the number three running back mm -hmm. behind Traylon Smith and um, T.J. Hammonds. Yeah. So he was listed as the number three running back at that point right at the end of the season. Um, I think he's one of those guys they looked at in the bowl practices and a guy that will get a, a bigger look this spring. And so the fact that he's not been mentioned doesn't mean very much. I, again, I think it's good that they didn't have to play a lot of true freshmen That's on this team this year. Yeah. All right. Our next question is from Pork Soda, who wants to know, who are your top three true freshmen from Pittman's first class? Ooh. Yeah, I'd go with Miles Slusher. He was, I think he was the number one guy in that recruiting class mm -hmm. in terms of actual rating. I'm going to look at their numbers of what they did. Slusher. Uh, I think was an, a number three cornerback at his, on his side, but he had uh, played in uh, six games, had nine total tackles, including a thrown for loss tackle, and he recovered two fumbles. So uh, he was productive. And then I go with Kari Johnson on, on the other side. He was actually a number two cornerback at his position. He was just a three-star out of high school, uh, but he played in eight games and had eight tackles and broke up a, a pass. And finally, I'd probably go with Marcus Henderson. He was a big offensive yeah. lineman out of Memphis. You're not going to play unless you've got real problems in the old line, a true yeah. freshman in the offensive line. But he's one of the guys they mentioned in the preseason is looking really good. Mm -hmm. And then in these bowl workouts where they actually scrimmaged some of these younger players and true freshmen, Sam Pittman singled him out, said he really looked good. So, again, we'll hear more from him this spring. And uh, I don't know if he'll, how much he'll play next year. I think their goal in the offensive line is, unless somebody is pretty remarkable, you're going to start them at best as a redshirt sophomore, third-year yeah. player. But uh, those are my three. I like those three. Those are good picks. Uh, Hogbud on Hogville asks, looking back, was it a good or bad decision to agree to play in a bowl game? They did all that work and didn't get to play. I would say you still made the right decision. I agree. You yeah. know, I mean, if you remember what Sam Pittman said when he was talking about before they'd been picked for a bowl game, he said, man, we want to play in a bowl game just to get those extra workouts. Right. So, no, it's not good that they didn't get to play, but they got those bowl workouts in. And what, why is that important? First of all, they got to see a lot of those younger players in scrimmage situations. That includes the freshman quarterback that they had. Yeah. I think they want to look at him because Felipe Franks is leaving, you want to know what you have. So you look at, you've got those coaches in the offseason in the winter conditioning program, they're sitting around the office. They can pull out those bowl practices yeah. and look at specific players. Now, what does that do? One thing it does, their recruiting is not finished yet. So they right. can look at certain players and say, well, wait a minute, do we need another defensive tackle? Do we need to get two more offensive linemen? So looking at somebody like Marcus Henderson, is he somebody that would help us next year? Or do we need to get a, a, you know, a JUCO guy or yeah. a grad transfer? So all of that helps. And it, I think it also helps them going into spring football to do their spring football yeah. planning. Because, again, they know where certain people, how they looked, what they need to do to develop. And so the bowl practices were necessary. It was a good thing. I wish they played the game. We all yeah. do. But... I think it, looking back on it, that's the one good thing that came out of the Texas yeah. Bowl invite. The extra work wasn't for nothing. So, Lanny has our next question for you, Mike. Wants to know, could TCU have played Arkansas or did they back out of the Texas Bowl because they thought they were going to lose to a 3-7 and seven team? We you know, know, we're never going <laughs> to... I was like, we'll never know. <laughs> we're never going to really know what happened because we're not on the ground at TCU. Yeah. You know, we're not inside their athletic department. We don't know. Here's the problem 
that I have and a lot of Razorback fans had with what happened. They waited until two days before the game. Yep. And then, and I'm not saying it, the COVID thing couldn't have, they got test numbers and they said that's what caused the problem. But when the athletic director released his statement, he said, we are doing this because of COVID numbers, low COVID, mm -hmm. we, because of COVID we got low numbers, injuries, and other circumstances. circumstances. What other circumstances? You need to explain that. First of all, if you're going to cancel a bowl game two days before the bowl game and disappoint all of those fans of both teams, including your fans, you need to explain what the COVID numbers were. Give those numbers and then detail the injuries. What injuries are you talking about? And then those other circumstances, if that's players opting out, then give the numbers. We had six players opted out. You need to be specific. This guy acted like he was canceling a luncheon appointment. <laughs> oh, I can't come. Uh, you know, I've got some other circumstances. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that was the problem I had with that whole thing. It sounded suspicious because they were way too vague about how this came about. But we'll never know. Yeah. We can't prove anything. I do think Razorback fans don't like TCU anymore. <laughs> if you go on the internet right now, there's a hate TCU is, thing going on. Is that going to be the next rivalry for Arkansas <laughs> TCU? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They want to play them. Right. Okay. Our next question comes from Facebook, actually. Did Texas Bowl officials make much of an effort to replace TCU in this game? Well, we can only go by what they said. Right. But Iowa was supposed to play Missouri in the Music City Bowl. Mm -hmm. And that got canceled on Sunday of that week. Right. Okay, this thing with Arkansas didn't happen until Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the Texas Bowl people are scrambling, and I think, I don't know if it was them or Arkansas, but somebody called up to talk to Iowa's head coach and said, hey, is there any way you can play us? Yeah. And he said, whoops, we just let our players go home. They'd yeah. have to turn around and come back or somehow right. reassemble in Houston. And if you think about how difficult that would have been, no matter who it was, and, and there was also a lot of fans mad because they knew that Army had been trying to get a game, but by that yeah. time, already Army already had a game. Mm -hmm. They got the Liberty Bowl, so they couldn't back they couldn't back out of that and then go to the Texas Bowl. Yeah. But if you think about how difficult that would have been, I don't care who you're talking about. Even if you've got players on campus, you're going to call them up and go, hey, get over here. Yeah. We're going to load our equipment up. And We're going to play on, a game in two days. We're going to get on a plane and fly <laughs> to Houston and play a team in two days. Like, we, we don't even know who we're playing. Yeah. That would have been tough for Arkansas, too. Yeah. Been kind of a crazy situation. So, again, we go back to the fact that it was two days before the yeah. game. Arkansas already had his players, uh, uh, Sam Pittman had his players loaded on the bus. They, they were, were fixing to leave to the complex and head out to the airport, and then this happened. It was yeah. just too late to do anything about it. Our next question comes from hashtag HammerDown, who says, are we seeing the death of bowl games? Maybe what we're seeing is the very start of that process. I don't think it's going to happen soon. And COVID certainly made it worse. Yeah. Because of, I think one of the things that happened is all these teams had, especially SEC teams like Arkansas, they had three wins and they got in a bowl game and people are going, what? what's that all about? Yeah. So I, I do think that this year, just watching these games, probably there was less interest than normal. In my opinion, long term, and I have no idea how long term this is, but the minute there was a college playoff, it started to diminish the bowl games. It doesn't, ta and I'm not just talking about with fans, it doesn't take a genius to realize that if you're a player and you're a senior and you're not in one of these playoff games, what does that bowl game mean? Yeah. To me, it's just an extra game. It's like you, can you imagine this at high school? Let's say Fayetteville didn't make the playoffs this yeah. year, but somebody went over to Casey Dick and said, hey, you guys can play some team over here for an extra game. Yeah. Well, you probably do it just for the practice and all that, but what would it really mean to the fans? It wouldn't mean anything. And that's what's starting to become obvious. We need a real playoff system. If you look at the NFL, if you look at high school teams all across the country, if you look at the football championship subdivision, that division under the BCS, yeah. if you look at them, they have a real playoff system. Look at the NCAA basketball tournament. That NCAA tournament is one of the biggest things in sports. It's 66, 
four or five, 66 teams. It lasts three weeks. It's huge. It's fun now to watch. we're sitting here with football, college football, and saying, oh no, we've got to have this bowl system. It was so, it's so traditional. And it, it's a leftover from the 1920s is when that stuff started, when they didn't have enough, I guess, sense to figure out a way to start a playoff system. Because by that time, they were already doing playoffs in high schools. So if you had a 16-team playoff that would last a month, all of those games matter. Yeah. So anybody tuning in knows one of those teams is staying alive and one of them's out. And the players are not going to opt out if they've got a chance to win a national championship, even if it's a long shot. Yeah. So the games mean more. And it would take, again, about a month. You'd probably have to play a game or two in early December. Then you'd have to take time off for finals. Then you might play a game around Christmas and then one around New Year's and then maybe one week after that. And it would be huge. How long is it going to take to do that? I don't think I'll be alive when it happens because the people that run college football are just, they sit around. I read something years ago that went, well, we went 10 years between the, the BCS where they had the original two teams. Right. Took 10 years to get, get from that to four teams. It's pro that's probably a good model. So based on that, it would be 10 more years till we got, you know, eight teams. Uh, yeah. And 10 more till we got 16. But in answer to the original question, bowl teams will, bowl games will eventually go away or they will be incorporated into this playoff system. But this dopey thing where you're just telling somebody, hey, we're going to go play a bowl game. Your season was bad, but so what? Play a bowl game. I mean, have the bowl game mean something. Well, you don't think like, so obviously this year it was different. You didn't have to it's, win a, a certain number of games. Every once in a while you've got a team like Arkansas that's bouncing back that really needs a game like yeah. that. But I don't know that that's a, a justification for to keep playing all these bowl games. Okay. I mean, again, you're, you're talking about teams that win five and six and seven games, and there's real playoff things that are going on there. Yeah. Where teams, you know, I think it's, I don't like this thing where they keep saying, well, the same two teams are going to win, blah, 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 but it's going to be Clemson and Alabama. Well, we know this year it's not. Yeah. And to me, if you watch the NCAA basketball tournament every year, they don't, those teams that are supposed to win don't win it every year. That's true. When you, the more you have to play games, the bigger the chance somebody stumbles, even in Alabama. Mm -hmm. So I like this idea that to win a national championship, you had to win in four straight games, not two. I like the idea. Fair enough. All right, our next question comes from Cool Hog, who says, Al.com says Coach O has Barry Odom on his list for defensive coordinator at LSU. What do you think? You know, if Barry Odom leaves Arkansas, I've said this before, I think it'll be for a head coaching job, and I don't think that yeah. will be in the next year or two. They're good friends. They really are, and he's here for a reason. I don't see him going to LSU. I, I do believe he's LSU's top choice based on what I've read. Yeah. But... Coach O's situation is not real good there. I don't think they're real happy with, with him right now. He's done all this stuff. I mean, they, he, they met, his staff managed COVID worse than any other team in the, in the SEC. They had COVID in the middle of the summer. They had COVID right before the start of football. They had COVID in the middle of the season. Yeah. They didn't seem to have any control over their players. Um, he has this ridiculously bad season compared to what they did what last they, yeah. year. Uh, it's understandable why it happened with all the players they lost, but that doesn't mean Still. LSU's fans accept that. Yeah. And then there are all these rumors about a, a booster that was in charge of an off-campus uh, development or program or something, and there was a lot of money in that program, and, and maybe he funneled that mo pro money into football. And, and anytime there's a thing like that, whether you know it or not, the NCAA yeah. is going to be investigating it. So... There's just a lot of questions hanging over that football program. I don't think Barry Odom would want to be a yeah. part of that right now. I don't think he would leave anyway. Especially since a lot of Arkansas fans love him here right now. That's so right. <laughs> why would you want to leave that? All right, our next question comes from Mount Porker, Mark, Mount Porker, excuse me, who asks if Sarkeesian comes calling, will Bryles leave? That would be more likely. Now, yeah. the one thing that I don't think would happen, and, and this boils down to whether or not Sarkeesian would want to call his own plays because I think maybe he would. He might. But if he's willing to give up play calling and he just wants to get somebody that will run his system, some people say, well, 
uh, Bryles runs a different system. In the old days when, when Sarkeesian first started out and he was a pro style guy, that might have been true. Now the lines are a little more blurred. There's not a whole lot of difference I, that I saw between what Alabama was trying to do and what Arkansas was trying to do. They just Alabama just did it better because they had yeah. better players. Both of those coaches believe in, in using the running backs that the run game is first. Mm -hmm. They both like to use their running backs in their passing game. So mm -hmm. there's some similarities there. I don't think that he would be the guy that was offered, yeah. but I, given his ties to, to the state of Texas, I believe that if, uh, if, if, if Coach Browse got offered that job, I think it would be very hard to turn it down. So we'll see. We'll see, yeah. All right, uh, Arkansas Redneck asks, what happened to the basketball team against Missouri? Tennessee killed those guys. Well, Aren't that, we all wondering that? <laughs> well, that was part of the problem, that Tennessee just blew them out, yeah. blew Missouri out. Uh, at Missouri, and people just went, well, uh, what's up well, with what's them? What's happening? And, and while that was happening, Arkansas was going on the road, and they had all these questions, you haven't played anybody, and they go out and have a big road win and won pretty handily at the end. And I think it was a case of the Nick Saban rat poison theory <laughs> because what's Arkansas player? They're hearing all this stuff all going into that game about, boy, yeah, they're better than we thought they were. Mm -hmm. And Tennessee, they're, or uh, Missouri's up there, and everybody's mad at them. Yeah, they're no really good. What game. happened to them? So they come in the game fired up and focused. Um, Eric Musselman said at the shoot-around before the game, he yeah. said, instead of focusing on business, his players were chattering and talking and not focusing. And so he, that was his way of saying, we didn't come into this game real focused. But there was a part of that game that has nothing to do with anything other than just it just happened. Yeah. This is not a bad shooting basketball team. Right. You can go look at their numbers going into that game. They have had stretches of games like any team does where the ball doesn't go down. You got mm -hmm. four or five possessions. You missed four or five shots that looked like they were going in. This was an entire game like that. Yeah. Until about the last two or three minutes, shots just weren't falling. And we're talking about any kind of shot you want to name. Yeah. A three-point shot, a short running jumper, a layup, layup, and especially the layups, and even free throws. Yeah. I mean, when Moses Moody misses back-to-back -back free throws, you're going, it's what's going night. on here? Yeah. It was almost like some crazy imbalance in the universe took place. <laughs> and I don't expect it to happen again. How rare was what happened? How rare was that? Yeah. It's ne they've never, uh, no Arkansas team, and I promise you there are plenty of Arkansas teams yeah. in the past that have been way, way worse than this one. Right. And this was the worst shooting ever by an Arkansas team in Bud Walton Arena. It's crazy. It was just wacky. Yeah. And how bad was it? Eric Musselman, did you watch him in his Zoom? Oh, he was so fuming. Did you see him? That part where he ducked his head down yeah. and he was almost he was like, like he was going to crawl under the like desk. <laughs> And he finally had to come back out to answer a question. <laughs> I mean, you could tell he was as baffled by it as anybody yeah. else. So I don't expect that to happen again. But the problem is the schedule is really tough. And they're without Justin Smith, who's kind of their inside right. defensive guy. They've got to figure out somebody else to put in there. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know if it's Jalen Williams has to play a lot more like he did. And he's just going to have to grow up soon. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is uh, Connor Vanover is going to have to get more He's physical defensively. Up. But see, oh, Jason Carroll and I disagree on this <laughs> a little bit because I'm not going to blame all of that on Vanover. A lot of the times he was having to come and help on defensive penetration because the guy who was penetrating was being defended by somebody that mm -hmm. blew it. Yeah. And a guy blew right by him and all of a sudden now you've got two, three guys that have to go in and try to stop that. And then they have that big guy over behind him, and you just toss it over to that guy, and he's Tillman. got a dunk. Yeah. So the answer to that is do a better, jo better job of perimeter defense mm -hmm. so Connor Vanover is not put in that position. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll cover all of that stuff in their workouts coming up for this Tennessee game. But he did say, though, Eric Muscle was like, we're probably not going to have it all figured out by Tennessee. Right. And so, that was kind of weird. Cause I, I just thought that was a bit he, odd, he, too. He, uh, he's a figure-outer guy. Right? He, he like he's going to stay up and all night. He out everything. <laughs> Maybe he was trying to fool Tennessee. Maybe he really has a plan. We'll see. We just don't know about it. <laughs> that would be nice. Would be. All right, one more for you, Mike. Uh, Super Hog. 1959 says a lot of younger fans probably don't remember but would you tell the story of the coach we had for one day he came he looked and he ran off 
You know, that was 13 years ago. I can't believe it. And his name was Dana Altman. Boy, this is a long story. It started <laughs> actually with Billy Clyde Gillespie at Texas A&M because okay. he was the hot coach out there. He was winning big. And uh, Stan Heath was having problems at Arkansas. Now, John White, the chancellor, loved Stan Heath. Okay. But Frank was starting to get frustrated with him. So Frank had this ex-Arkansas basketball coach who was down in that area, and he apparently had talked to Gillespie, and Gillespie said, man, I'd go to Arkansas in a heartbeat. So Frank goes to John White, I'm gonna fire Stan Heath. John yeah. White, no, 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 don't do it. <laughs> Finally talks him into it. They fire Heath at about the same time that Kentucky needs a coach, and Kentucky offers him first, and oh, he goes yeah. there. So now <laughs> Frank is left holding the bag, and John White's really mad, so what do you do? Well, Frank looked around, and he saw Altman up there at Creighton, and he'd done a good job, so he hires him. Mm -hmm. So Altman comes in for the press conference, but he's very awkward at the press conference. Yeah. You can tell he's kind of like, oh, I don't know, and he called the Hogs really badly. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a thing. When you get hired at Arkansas in a sport like basketball or yeah. football, you got to know how to do it. They, they sort of tell you, yeah. okay, they give you a, a little training thing, and apparently they did with him, and it didn't work. <laughs> I was told later by somebody at Creighton that knew Altman that he said that when he got up to that press conference, it really hit him what he had done, and he started thinking, I got to get out of this, oh but he gosh. just didn't know how. It, you, it'd be like you're about to marry a girl, yeah. or you're about to marry a guy, and then all of a sudden you just leave right before the right wedding. Right before the wedding. That's kind Jeez. of bad. Yeah, just So a he decided bit. not to do it. So he goes up to his office right after the press conference mm -hmm. and starts talking to the players. And immediately he senses some academic issues that were like, ooh, we got to solve these problems. There's yeah. some things been going on here that I don't like. So he wanted to bring his academic advisor for basketball in from Creighton, a guy he trusted. Yeah. But he's got to get permission to do that. So he calls over to talk to Frank, and Frank has already gone to play golf at Augusta National. <laughs> And somebody over there, and I'm not going to name this person because I'm not trying to embarrass them, but they really blew it. It was an, a, an athletic administrator under Frank. Yeah. And he told Altman, uh, you can't bother Frank when he's on the golf course. Wait till Monday. Now, that is so stupid. <laughs> I have called Frank Broyles at Augusta. I mean, I, the first time I did it, I didn't think he would answer because right. it was something that was going on and I needed an answer. Hey, what's going on? Well, this is Mike. Oh, hey, Mike. Yeah. And he was fine. There was no problem. He mm -hmm. didn't get mad. He just answered the question. So certainly Altman could have called him about this. Right. Can I hire my academic advisor? Frank would have probably said, sure, do what you need to do. Yeah. You're the new coach. You do whatever you have to do. But now he has no answer. So he's got a dinner appointment that night with John White, the chancellor. So he thinks, well, I'll talk to him about it. Yeah. Maybe I can get the phone number or maybe I can get permission from him. Yeah. So they have dinner and they talk and John White just kind of blows him off like, I don't know, I don't know. It's, not, <laughs> it's not my deal, you know, talk to Broyles. Jeez. So at that point, he goes back to his hotel room. Mm -hmm. He's still in a hotel room. And he just thinks for a while and he says, this place is nuts, <laughs> I'm leaving. So he calls his boss at Creighton and says, oh, can I come back? Yeah. And the guy says, sure, we'd love to have you back. And he oh. left. Now, it's not over yet. The story's yeah. not over. Because now, Frank's got egg all over his face, and John White, who didn't want Stan Heath fired in the first place, mm -hmm. steps in and goes, all right, you did it your way, and you made a mess of it. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be the one that hires the next Gosh. head coach. And Frank sort of backed off and felt like he was in a weakened position and let him do it. And what John White did was he hired a search committee who then came up with John Pelfrey who didn't have enough experience for that job and ended up being a disaster and ended up getting fired. Yeah. So all of that could have been prevented had that one person in the athletic department not said, oh, you can't talk to him. Uh, Frank, Frank doesn't like it when you call him on the golf course. Call him, just talk to him on Monday. If he'd have given him his phone number, none of that would have happened. Oh, geez. But we still ended up with Coach Musselman, yeah, so, so it, who cares? It all works out well, I guess, in the end. I like that story, though. That's fun. Uh, not for, I guess, anyone at the time, but at the time, it, was <laughs> it wasn't. As but wacky now, as you hindsight can get. 2020. <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Ask Mike for Micro. When I'm Terry Talmadge, we'll see you back here next Monday.